Another door problem becomes a major contributing factor in this near fatal Beechcraft C-99 freighter accident in New Hampshire on Friday, 26 January. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. Let's check it out. Here's what the crash looked and sounded like as caught by a backyard security camera and posted here on uh, ABC5 WCVB. <coughs> So the aircraft came through a series of wires, power power poles that caused the uh, what you see the sparks erupting just to the left and right of the aircraft, and the pilot is very lucky to be alive. And the aircraft had plenty of fuel, over 250 gallons of fuel, and there was no fire. Very very lucky. Here on the Aviation Safety Network, Beechcraft C-99 Commuter, Ameriflight operated by Wiggins Airways, November 53 Romeo Papa, a 1992 model aircraft powered by two PT-6A Pratt & Whitney engines. One occupant on board, seriously injured. An Ameriflight Beechcraft C-99 Commuter freighter conversion performing Wiggins Airways Flight 1046 impacted trees and trains 70 feet from a single family home in uh, London, Londonderry, New Hampshire. The sole pilot suffered serious injuries and the aircraft was destroyed. The aircraft took off from runway 06 at Manchester Boston Regional Airport, New Hampshire at 0710 local time. ADSB data shows that the aircraft began to follow an erratic course a few minutes after takeoff with varying altitude and speed. The accident occurred just 17 minutes after takeoff. Looking at the initial ADSB data from FlightAware, we can see right away on takeoff this aircraft is all over the sky before impacting right about back in here. And so the takeoff begins normally, but pretty quick after takeoff, right around 2,000 feet or so, there's a bit of a descent and then a big climb to the left with the speed coming way down to nearly stall speed at 3,000 feet and 54 miles an hour. Let's take a closer look at the track log. So climbing out 1,300, 1,500 feet per minute, then a 2,000 foot per minute climb, then an 1,800 foot per minute rate of descent, and the speed drops down. Look at that, they basically stalled the aircraft, 21 mile an hour ground speed, descending at 1300 feet recovers the aircraft amazing job of recovering recovering the aircraft at this low altitude gets into what looks like perhaps a second stall situation with a 56 knot ground speed this time at 5100 feet absolutely struggling with the aircraft nearly immediately after takeoff now of course icing situations or icing conditions prevail at the time of this accident but this is this is much too sudden and too quick to be attributable right away to icing unless there was a problem with de-icing the aircraft to begin with, but that's not the case. So the pilot continues to struggle with the aircraft until impacting just some 17 minutes after takeoff. So right away on the ASN network, we get these two pictures of the crashed aircraft. The pilot survived the crash. He even called 911. He was one of the several callers to 911 that a plane had crashed. And it looks like firefighters were able to extract him out of the right front windshield. We're looking at the front of the aircraft. Here's the right engine. Here's the right windshield right here. But what's going on behind? We see this opening right over here on the left side of the aircraft. Here's a picture of the left side of the crashed aircraft. 5.3 Romeo Papa. Here we can see, we just barely see the right windshield that's been popped out, again, I believe by firefighters to extricate the pilot. But here is the open pilot access door slash emergency hatch on these C-99 Beechcraft aircraft. I'll show you more of this in a moment. But the door is not just open, it's gone. Uh, did firefighters remove that door to try to extricate the pilot or did it come off in flight and this is too crunched up here now had this door been on the airplane 
and survive this crash in this condition, I don't think firefighters or anybody would be able to open this door because of its crunched condition up against the cockpit. And then over the weekend, apparently investigators were able to find the cockpit door located several miles from the crash site, not too far away from the airport where the aircraft took off from. Here's another view of the same door, the cockpit door, looking at it from the inside view. By the way, this is your speaker. <laughs> Half of your audio system is gone with the door. Missing that speaker, there's another speaker on the right-hand side of the aircraft. And as required by most of these older aircraft, besides having a headset and microphone system, you also have a separate old-time microphone in the aircraft. Just like in the 310, you can pick it up and talk on the microphone and use these speakers as a backup system if your headset fails or lose your headset. And within four hours of this crash, our friend Victor over at Vass Aviation posted this um, video. And from this video, you can distinctly hear the change in audio from the transmissions by the pilot. Queens 1046, contact Boston, park traffic, good flight. Over to Boston, we're going to 1046, good night. Boston, departure, we're going to 1046 through 1 1.3, heading 150. So there we can hear the normal audio of the Beach 99. It's very noisy inside this aircraft with the two PT6 engine turboprops running, but that's normal audio. So this report of moderate precipitation on his route plus the icing conditions at the time led a lot of us to believe that this might have been an icing related accident and it still may very well be a contributing factor to this overall accident scenario. Here's the weather at Manchester at the time, four miles, rain, mist, uh, two degrees uh, Celsius on the temperature. That's just about perfect temperature, dew point spread, and conditions for freezing precipitation, one of the most hazardous forms of precipitation out there. Of course, this aircraft is equipped with boots, but it can only take so much. Okay, we don't hear back from Wiggins 1046 for quite some time because once the door gets ripped off right next to your pilot seat there, there goes your headsets and everything else. It's going to be very hard to communicate over the roar of this open cockpit. Wiggins 1046, Boston Approach. Wiggins 1046, Boston Approach, how do you hear? And he immediately begins having control difficulties with the aircraft. Was he trying to hang on to the door when he noticed it became unlatched and then pulled the door off? The pilot survived. He's going to have a hell of a story to tell. Okay, there's the new audio with the door open. You can't even hear the pilot at this point. He's trying to make a transmission. Desperate, desperately we trying to get a hold of him. Yep, 
So Care 410 tries to get a hold of Wiggins 1046 to no avail. The pilot continues to struggle with the aircraft. Is he attempting to s- slow the aircraft down in an effort to relatch the door? Wiggins uh, 1046, Care uh, 410. Wiggins 1046, Care 410. Care 410, thanks for uh, trying. I also tried on the guard frequency too. Yeah, I heard, thank you. Wiggins 1046, Manchester Star, how do you read me? And yeah, Care 410, you can return to 125.05 and just do it at Far Harbor. 2505 Far Harbor, careful today. Wiggins 1046, Boston Approach. Wiggins 1046, Manchester Tower. And Wiggins 1046, if you can hear this, uh, you can fly any approach you need into uh, Manchester. Wiggins 1046, Manchester Tower, if you copy this, I don't. There you can definitely hear the change in audio with the door wide open. And it sounds like perhaps he maybe was able to put on an oxygen mask in an effort to reestablish communications with ATC. Because it sounds like it's got that sewer pipe sound to it, like you're talking into an oxygen mask. Now, Wiggins 1046, maintain uh, enter above 2000, disable, and fly heading of 180. Wiggins 1046, boss approach. And Wiggins 1046, uh, I believe you said you want the ILS 35. You hear this heading of 170, and maintain uh, enter above 2000. Now, Wiggins 1046, uh, never got an ident. Fly not received. And, uh, I again if you can hear this transmission. Wiggins 1058, man, start you up. We're up and ready to go. Wiggins 1058, it's going to be a little bit probably because the uh, company's uh, Nordo right now over the field. Uh, you, you wouldn't happen to have a phone number for a dispatch or anything for your company, would you? Yeah, I can give you the, the number for company. Hold on. Just sure. Now, Wiggins 1046, uh, about three miles to your west area of higher terrain, maintain at or above 2,500. And Wiggins 1046, if uh, you can hear me, fly heading of 190 and uh, maintain at or above 2,500. Inspector for the ILS 35. They're trying to get him on this instrument approach here for runway 35. And Wiggins 1046, did you hear this transmission ident? And Wiggins 1046, Boston Approach. And uh, you can fly any approach you need into Manchester. And uh, if you can hear this ident. And Wiggins 1046, information Delta is current in Manchester. The wind calm is still the four. Rain, mist, ceiling, 900 broken, 1,400 broken, 2,100 overcast. Temperature 2, 2.0, altimeter 3020. Lower altitude alert, Wiggins 1046. Uh, minimum altitude, IFR altitude in the area is 2000. Check your altitude immediately. Six, Manchester Airport, 11 o'clock and 4 miles. I uh, correct 10 o'clock and 4 miles. And Wiggins 1046, there's an obstacle at your 12 o'clock and 2 miles, 600 feet. Airport 8, exit runway 35. Airport 8, exit runway 35. And that's about where the flight ends as he was attempting to do his left base entry back onto the instrument approach for runway 35, much too low. Now here's a picture of a different aircraft. Same make and model. This is a bird strike picture, but it illustrates how this cockpit door is supposed to work. So the idea with these aircraft is that you fill the aircraft with boxes using the cargo door on the left rear side of the aircraft. And then if it's too full to climb on up into the cockpit, you use this little cockpit door to access the cockpit. It's also an emergency escape hatch as well for the pilot. So it swings down and latches using two pins. There's two pins located up here and two latches located down here. 
Okay, here's the cockpit door we're talking about, hinged at the top, handle at the bottom, and a relatively complicated little mechanical system that has to be carefully kept in adjustment in order to keep this door from flying open. By the way, here's the rear cargo door on the left rear side of the aircraft. That's where you load the cargo up. And then if it's too full to get in the aircraft, you use this cockpit door to enter the aircraft. Also serves as an emergency exit. So here's the handle to this door inside the cockpit, this half circle ring on a hinge pin there. And here's the handle on the outside of the aircraft, number 19 right here. And here is the two pins yeah what is that number 20 inside the door itself and here are the two latches number 14 that latch the pins and here's the rather complicated little mechanical system that has to be carefully kept in adjustment in order to latch the door so the door handle rotates a gear and a chain drive and moves the two latches up over and click click latches the two pins in place and here's the placard inside the cockpit that helps you identify that the door is in the locked position. And I believe there's also a couple of little portholes right here that you can look into to make sure that these latches are latched from inside the cockpit. And here's an excerpt from the operating manual before starting engines checklist. Step number eight, pilot's entrance hatch, if installed, locked. Caution, the properly... To properly lock the hatch, the locking handle must be rotated counterclockwise to the fully open position, then the handle rotated in the locked position. The lock mechanism cannot be properly locked unless the handle has been moved to the fully open position first. Well, that makes a lot of sense. The locking mechanism should be felt to go over center into the locked position, and the handle should align with the locked position indicator on the placard behind the handle. Now here's the relatively complicated little latch mechanism adjustment program that you got to do with these doors in order to keep them from flying open. And as I understand it, I believe these aircraft are currently grounded until inspectors or mechanics get in there and make sure that these doors are correctly adjusted. So this pilot's going to have a hell of a story to tell investigators. Why did he have such a hard time controlling the aircraft once this door left the aircraft? Unlike so many small general aviation aircraft whose doors are hinged at the front in the GA aircraft if the door pops open they pop open a couple of inches and just stay there but the door stays on the aircraft it's a very surprising and shocking and loud event when that door pops open and in GA aircraft folks have lost control of the aircraft by failing to aviate navigate and communicate flying they drop the airplane in order to fiddle with the door in this case with the door leaving in this case with the door hinged at the top if it pops open it's going to depart the aircraft altogether so did that cause some sort of controllability issue with the aircraft did it hit something on the tail on the way out why did this pilot have such a hard time maintaining control of the aircraft was he simply freezing to death in these freezing cold conditions um uh, trying to fly the airplane we don't know yet Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. As we get more information on this, hopefully we'll get an NTSB preliminary report. If it's got some more detailed information on this, we'll certainly let you know on this channel. See you here.